Christ is risen as he said. Alleluia, alleluia. Alleluia, alleluia. Today on the second Sunday of Easter, we celebrate the fact that by the wounds of Christ, the wounds which he showed to St. Thomas, Thomas who doubted, Thomas who missed Mass on Easter Sunday and didn't make it till the next Sunday, Thomas, who absented himself from the community, perhaps overwhelmed with his own grief, his own sadness, his own sorrow at the death of his Lord, Thomas is invited by Jesus to touch his wounds. And St. Peter, in his first letter from which we hear in the second reading today, further on in that letter says, by his wounds you have been healed. Do you know in the early church, they did not put the body, the corpus of Christ on a cross because they were still crucifying people in the Roman Empire. It was too hideous a reality that they looked at, that they faced day after day. What did they put as the early Christians began to fashion crosses to wear? Jewels at each of the five points of the wounds. Because those wounds are the precious jewels of our faith. By his wounds, by the blood that he shed on the cross, we are forgiven. Listen to what we hear from St. Peter today. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, we have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are regarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in these last days. What a gift. What a treasure we receive from Almighty God. When Thomas shows up on the second Sunday of Easter. Jesus doesn't chastise him. Jesus doesn't throw him out for being a doubter. Jesus doesn't say, you abandoned me. What's the matter with you? Where's your faith? Instead, he invites him to touch the wounds, the wounds of Christ by which we are healed, our souls are saved. Today, at the Vatican earlier this morning, Pope Francis, along with Pope Benedict at his side, Two popes canonized two popes. Pope John the 23rd, now Saint John, and Pope John Paul II, now Saint John Paul. These two saints canonized who lived in the era of the 20th century, which of all history has been the bloodiest. More wounds, more bloodshed than the whole history of the world. Listen to what Pope Francis said this morning. These popes, now he's referring to St. John and St. John Paul, lived through the tragic events of that century, the 20th, but they were not overwhelmed by them. For them, God was more powerful. Faith was more powerful. Faith in Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of man and the Lord of history. Pope Francis said at the heart of this Sunday, which concludes the octave of Easter and which John Paul II wished to dedicate to divine mercy, which is the image you have before you, and to the glorious wounds of the risen Christ Jesus. Then he speaks about St. Thomas. That man, so straightforward and accustomed to testing everything personally, knelt before Jesus with the words, my Lord, and my God. The wounds of Jesus, Pope Francis says, are a scandal, a stumbling block for faith, yet they are also the test of faith. That is why on the body of the risen Christ the wounds never pass away, they remain. For those wounds are the enduring sign of God's love for us. They are essential for believing in God. 
Not for believing that God exists, but for believing that God is love, mercy, and faithfulness. St. John the 23rd and St. John Paul the 2nd were not afraid to look upon the wounds of Jesus, to touch his torn hands and his pierced side. They were not ashamed of the flesh of Christ. They were not scandalized by him or by his cross. They did not despise the flesh of their brother because they saw Jesus in every person who suffers and struggles. These were two men of courage and they bore witness before the church and the world to God's goodness and mercy. Unquote. Think about what they endured. John the 23rd grew up in Italy suffering through World War I as a boy. And nobody could imagine that there could ever be anything worse than World War I. They called it the Great War and it was the war to end all wars. And yet, our Lord appeared to a nun by the name of Sister Faustina Kowalska, just outside of Krakow, Poland, where she was in the convent. And she appeared in the image that you see before you today, known as the Divine Mercy. He said to Sister Maria Faustina, if the world does not turn to my mercy, there will be a greater war that it shall suffer. And so he gave her this image with the words at the bottom, Jesu ufam tobie, Polish for Jesus, I trust in you. And out of his side, out of the wound, now here we're reflecting again on the holy wounds of Christ, this jewel of our salvation, out of the side wound, which represents the bursting of his sacred heart, bursting out of love for us upon the cross, are two rays of light. You will see one is red and one bluish white. The bluish white represents baptism by which our sins are forgiven. And, of course, reconciliation, the sacrament of reconciliation, when we go to confession, which restores us or reconciles us to baptismal innocence. That's the bluish white. The red ray out of the wound of his heart represents the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, the blood and the body of Christ. And so he says, by these means, he desires to cleanse and purify the world and to give the world his mercy very personally, individually, to us who seek it. But we must seek the mercy, this great gift, this great treasure. It's like the soldier piercing the side of Christ raided the treasury of God's mercy and outpoured his precious blood by which we are saved. Do we actually when we receive the body and blood of Christ, do we absorb this grace or do we allow it simply to pass through us and lose the grace? Do we become by the mercy of God apostles of mercy to others? By the Lord who has forgiven you, are you ready and willing to forgive others so that they too can experience the joy of the gospel? Pope John Paul, who grew up not far away from this convent of the Divine Mercy, where St. Faustina is buried, studied this and realized she was quite right and that the revelation was true. And so it was he who elevated this second Sunday of Easter to a feast day called Divine Mercy Sunday. And that's what we're celebrating today, that God desires, God thirsts for us to receive his mercy. Are we ready and willing? The 20th century was a century of such nightmare, such a living hell. 40 million died at the hands of the Nazis. They invaded Poland and were going to destroy Catholicism there. It didn't work. The Polish Catholics were so strong they surrounded the shrine of Our Lady of Czestochowa that the Nazis were going to shut down their ancient shrine of the Blessed Virgin, before which they have prayed for about a thousand years. And they took half a million Poles to surround it. And the Nazis couldn't kill them all at once, so they withdrew. Then, 
came the communists. It is estimated about 100 million people that they killed. They too came and said they were going to destroy this center of Catholicism, the shrine of Our Lady of Czestochowa. And you know what the Polish people did? They doubled the numbers. One million of them came out to surround that mountain shrine, that hilltop shrine, and the communist troops withdrew. Are we ready to defend our faith? Are we willing to bring hope into a world that has seen so much horror, so much hate, so much violence, and say, we believe we have the answer. It is the resurrection of Christ. And his greatest attribute is his divine mercy. Pope Francis has made it very clear in his latest letter, The Joy of the Gospel, that we must bring that joy and hope to the world because the kingdom of God's mercy, the kingdom of God's love, is in our hands. The kingdom of hate is pressing against all believers. And therefore, all believers must reunite and stand strong in the faith. This is what Pope Francis concludes with. In these two men, St. John Paul, St. John the 23rd, who looked upon the wounds of Christ and bore witness to his mercy, there dwelt a living hope and an indescribable and glorious joy. The hope and the joy which the risen Christ bestows on his disciples, the hope and the joy which nothing and no one can take from them. This hope and this joy were palpable in the earliest community of believers in Jerusalem. This is also the image of the church which the Second Vatican Council sets before us. John the 23rd and John Paul II cooperated with the Holy Spirit in renewing and updating the church in keeping with her pristine features of simplicity, fraternity, love, and mercy. In his own service to the people of God, John Paul II was the Pope of the family. He himself once said that he wanted to be remembered as the Pope of the family. And interestingly enough, dear brothers and sisters, this year there is going to be in Rome a synod on the family. And so we pray that the joy of Easter, the hope of Easter, the mercy won for us at Easter will enter into the home of every family in this parish and that we will experience what it is that made John Paul II a great and saintly pope and John the 23rd coming out of the reconstruction of the World War II to say, open the doors of the church. Allow the spirit to move in your soul, in my soul, and throughout our community. And then we shall rejoice as we sing Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Amen.